you could try a million things to get rid of fear, ice baths, climbing a mountain and like looking in the mirror and saying, I'm amazing. It's like all these things that are temporary. But when you really look at it, it's like the righteous are as bold as a lion. And as long as you have a clear heart before God, you ain't living a sketchy double life, no skeletons in your closet. It's almost impossible not to be fearless. Welcome to the second season of Cultural Catalyst, where we help you to learn to be fully alive, co-labor with God, and change the world. I'm your host, Chris Valentin, and today I have, I think it's my favorite guest, Jimmy Dart. He is a BSSM alumni. He's a social media philanthropist. He's crowdsourced funds for random acts of kindness and generosity for people Welcome on the show. Let's get it. I'm excited to be here. It's an honor. BSSM, tell us about what led you to school ministry, first of all, before we talk about all the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because we haven't talked about that yet. Yeah, yeah. I was in Brazil doing some just mission work with some people, uh, one of my old mentors and another guy. We were just, it was during the Olympics in Sao Paulo. So we were just praying for people, speaking at churches. And I had just finished up doing YWAM. And so I'm doing this now, feeling super pumped up. And I get like a card um, in the mail um, from my grandma, I believe it was. Yeah, like I think it was a card she sent. And I open it up and it's like, Jimmy, I hope you're doing great. But I think you should go to Bethel. You need more training. And I was like, dang, grandma, like, all right. And she was just saying that, like, I don't know. I I think she just felt like I needed, uh, you know, a little bit more training under my belt. And so I really wanted to go to Bethel to learn about bringing the kingdom into the world, finances and all that, because I had a really messed up perspective of that in the past, where if I had $10,000 saved up in my account and I heard some mission trips like bus exploded and they needed 10 grand, I thought I had to give all 10 grand or I was going to hell. Like that was my perspective of that. And I knew at Bethel, they knew how to like steward finances, live generous, but grow and like, you know, not live in this constant place of like, it's, it's just bad to do anything or to move forward. And so when I went there, um, it was extremely powerful, did two years, did third year for like three days. And it was, it was incredible. (laughs) Did, uh, did, was there any connection between you going to BSSM and this like media, social media space? Did, was there any connection between that? No, I had, I had not, I had stopped making videos fully. So I, uh, after I got saved. Oh, you were making videos before that because you were, before you were saved, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I was doing crazy stuff before I was saved like just wild prank videos. Like I'd go in a highway, fall asleep and back traffic up for miles. Or I'd uh, get people coming out of Dick's Sporting Goods that just bought a gun and like try to arrest them. And you know, just crazy stuff like that. When I was 18 is when I got saved and my pastor called me into his office and he goes, Jimmy, you're a Christian now. I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, I'm looking at your YouTube videos right now. They don't line up at all with the Bible. He's like, if you're legit, go home and delete them. And I was like, dang. And sometimes you really need that, like a father in your life, someone, man, so many people just pat people's backs, but it's very appropriate at times for someone to shoot you straight. And I went home, opened up my computer, looked at all my videos and I was like, well, my grades aren't that good. Like (laughs) if I delete this, like Jesus better take care of me because I have no backup plan. You know, like I can't be a doctor. I don't know like how to do hardly anything. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, man, if I delete everything, there's no way when I'm 90, I'm going to be like, I regret giving everything to God. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. And I clicked delete. And then it said, are you sure you want to delete? And I was like, dang it, now the devil's coming up. So I ended up erasing everything, doing that, and uh, went off the internet completely for, well, well, what I should say is actually when I deleted all that, I immediately was like, you know what, I'm going to start making videos now, but do it for God. And so I would... uh, take homeless people like find like on Valentine's Day I found this homeless guy got him a Valentine's Day did all types of different stuff Um, but the truth was God didn't want me just to stop making bad videos. He wanted me to stop making videos entirely because that was my identity and who I was. And so 
that was a whole nother thing when I got convicted to stop making videos that I thought were benefiting the kingdom. Like completely, you completely yeah. stopped. So it's like he cares less sometimes about your impact and more about you because he, he sees down the road rather than just the temp, temperate. And so I erased everything, and that's when I came to Bethel. I was doing no videos, no social media, nothing. Great time in my life, just such a clear mind and head when you're not on the Internet. And, uh, yeah, so it was fully— How long did you, like, stay off the social media? Uh, about four years. You stayed off for four years. Yeah, about four years, and uh, I'm I'm in uh, the main campus here, and I walk in there, and this lady that I like didn't know anything about, um, she's like, "Yeah, I have a word for you," and I was like, you "Got a word for <laughs> me? Cool, I'll like record this, you know." So <laughs> exactly. I have it on my phone, and she goes, "God's gonna put a root system and people around you, and in the next five years, He's gonna do this, and you're gonna have your own TV show." And I was like, what the heck? Like, God told me not to make videos. What are you talking about? Like, TV show? Like, how's that going to happen? And so I recorded that, had it in my pocket. And then, sure enough, as things worked out, it's been about five and a half years now. And I just last week shot my first ever episode of my TV show that's coming out. That's so, it's, so amazing. Can yeah. you say what the name of your TV show is yet? Yeah, it's called Undercover Kindness. So Undercover. Ooh, that's a good. Yeah. That's a book too right there, bro. Yeah, exactly. It is. Yeah, I'm coming <laughs> out with a book called like the same, I think, too. You so, are? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, man, I'm getting excited about that. Hey, what's been the most impactful interaction you've ever had? Let, let's say since you were saved, like not obviously with Jesus, not with Jesus, of course. Yeah. I mean, the most impactful encounter you ever have is with Jesus, but yeah. with people. Like, what's the most impactful thing that's ever happened with people? Yeah. Um, it's really funny because I could think of probably a hundred different ones, but the most recent one that I was just telling somebody about that I thought of was there was this homeless gentleman in Los Angeles that I was helping him out, and he started sharing with me. He goes, you know what I do when all these fancy, nice cars are parked here and I see the parking meters are going to expire and they give him a ticket? I go and I fill up those meters so they don't get tickets, and they don't know I do it, but I do it. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like the way people perceive this man versus how he actually is couldn't be far more different. And this guy's literally an undercover angel. And when I saw that, I was like, man, that's so powerful. And there's so many people, um, the people in my videos that I ask for help and they help me. And then we get to change their life. The, the thing to remember is this, this person, and maybe they give me $2 to catch a bus or some money to get a food. It's not the first time they've done that in their life. They've been living a whole lifestyle like that. And it's never wow. been noticed. But in that one moment, you know, they get put on the spotlight. They become the hero. But God really sees and pays attention when no one else is looking. And so who you That's are amazing. when no one's around is really who you are. And for me, that I really discovered that when I did first year here at Bethel. And then second year, I went to Austin, Texas to help with one of the church plants. Yeah. I never ended up really helping with it because I got <laughs> off work, was so tired. I slept past <laughs> service. But when I was there living alone, like no friends, no community in Austin, Texas for about eight months, I lived the same way I lived when I was here in whatever you call it, a Christian Disneyland. And that was such a telling time for me to know like, man, this really is who I am. I'm not a product of the environment. I'm a product of the gospel and I can continue living like this. And so I think that was super impactful for me to see. What you do when no one's looking matters to God, right? Yeah, well, that's profound. So this homeless guy, he isn't, you know, he, he, he isn't key in the the rich people's yeah, cars. Yeah. Instead, he's making sure they don't get tickets. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just wild. Like, there's such a grace of God. Whether he knew Jesus very personally or didn't, there's a, there's a grace of God that's kind of given to mankind regardless to where they feel compassion and love. And there's really a remarkable things people do that, you know, don't even have relationships with God. And so yeah. when you think of now having a relationship with him, how much more should we be able to access and do with that, you know? Yeah, it's true. It's like before you know God, God knows you, right? And I think about Moses, you know? Like Moses doesn't know God till he, he encounters the burning bush. Yeah. But he's already walking out his destiny because God knows him, saves mm -hmm. him from the Nile River. 
yeah you know puts this call in his life pretty profound yeah there's this guy i forget his name but i was somewhere and i heard him speak he was in san francisco he was like this massive drug lord and he was making like fifty thousand dollars a day selling drugs the fbi agents were looking for him everybody was like trying to catch this guy and he was so smart he would change his address he would go to a different house and he avoided like the cia his whole life and then he got radically saved and he moved to the Middle East. Now he uses every exact skill set and technique the same way he does there to smuggle Bibles in, to start underground churches. <laughs> and it's like God was mentoring him through the process. This is very bizarre. Well, wow, yeah. The, the idea, we were made in God's image and his likeness, the idea that God loved us before, basically before we deserved it, right? loved us before we knew him and was already working in our lives before we actually knew him. that's pretty profound yeah hey what's the biggest challenge you've ever had in your work like it, you know things go wrong right yeah you're working like you're, you're you're i mean you're filming it but it's unscripted right it's unscripted you're just working with people you don't have no idea how the response is going to go when you're doing your random acts of kindness right yeah and yeah. it can't always go well right yeah um yeah, for the, I mean, there's definitely different stories I could get into. I think the the most, the biggest struggle day to day is really, it's such a sensitive deal because we're dealing with people and we're dealing with, you know, um, pretending as if there's no cameras there, really having interaction with someone, making it authentic, loving for them, praying for them, and really forgetting the, the, the best videos are shot when you're not aware that you're shooting a video. Exactly. And you're treating the person like a person. So for the biggest struggle for me is I, I have to have these authentic moments where I'm crying with people. I hear their story and it's it's wild and, and this and that. But I have to make sure like I'm angled the right way for the camera shot. I ask the right certain <laughs> questions because when I go home and edit that video, if one thing is off or or I asked a question a little too late, that go fund me for the single mom that we're raising, it could if the video goes instead of getting one million views, it got ten million views, that's an extra fifty thousand dollars for that lady's life that fell on me because I edited it wrong or whatever. So Wow. It's this constant thing of really doing this with the Lord um, and and just the whole process and, and making sure it's right and, and also just staying so humble. And, and when comments come in and they say, Jimmy, this is great, whatever, be like, no, like I'm lit. It, it was God's idea. I'm just doing what I was told. Like if you like the food at the restaurant I'm working at, great. I'm literally the server. I didn't create the restaurant. And what I like about what I get to do especially is 95% of the comments aren't about me. They're about the people because my face isn't even in the videos. I don't even know how people recognize me because I think I have a weird voice and right now I'm kind of sick. But <laughs> but yeah, so that that's kind of the biggest struggle is, you know, working effectively while keeping presence on what you're doing. Yeah, You know, kind of how like Bill would talk about like the dove on your shoulder yeah. and living in a way where the dove doesn't fly away. Obviously the Holy Spirit won't yeah. leave you, but the abiding of its presence resting yeah. on you and being able to do things and, and just be constantly busy, but do it in grace, you know? What's the biggest lesson you've learned? Like you've been doing this now for like four or five years, right? At least. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, I've been doing it for probably 20 some years when I was a little kid. But, yeah. but yeah, more on As a video believer, for yeah. like four years, three, four years. And what, what's the biggest lesson you've learned personally? Yeah, the biggest lesson I've learned is to not get over spiritual. Honestly, I think that is the biggest, that is the right biggest there. trap in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and I get where it comes from. It comes from a place of people wanting to do things with pure intentions, to not strive, to not do it in their own strength. But you know, the enemy just loves to do that to paralyze Christians. I always like to say like, the world has amazing drive and no purpose for a large part. Oof. And the church has amazing purpose and no drive. And if you can partner those things together, something amazing can happen. And so I try to still live very spiritual. Like God can speak to me and do something, whatever. But if the Lord speaks to me about something and it's at the cost of someone else and doesn't line up with his word, yeah. that wasn't him speaking to me as much as I thought it was. Yeah. Like if, you know, the Lord says like, go to a, you know, uh, I'm just trying to think like, go to a soccer game and after the game's over, stay there for 10 hours. Like, 
all right, now the custodians are mad. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to stay up late. Now they can't see their kids. Like that probably wasn't the Lord. So using his voice, but being also very practical. And that's what's one of the things that kind of launched me is before I started doing these videos, when I came downstairs in my house, 25 years old, living at my parents' house, working in my dad's restaurant, he said, Jimmy, what do you want to do with your life? And when I heard that, I was like, what? Obviously, it means not working for you if you're in that. And uh, I wasn't the best cook. I'm left-handed. I'd always spill the soup. And so, uh, you know, I'm like, if I could do anything, it would be go around the country, give away as much money, change people's lives as possible, but do it in the name of Jesus. But I'm like, I can't apply on Craigslist for that. It's not a job. Like, you, what do you just pull it off in the air? And my dad's very old school, works like 80 hours a week. And he goes, start tomorrow. And I was like, what? That is the most anti-Christian, like everyone's like, you got to have door open up and, you know, just yeah. do it. When yeah. this, and when I heard that, I went to my room and I was like, maybe my dad's right. Maybe if, if I was the enemy, what I would want to do is find people with amazing talents, giftings and callings and just paralyze them for 15 years and then maybe launch them to do it beyond the time they were supposed to do it. Yeah. And so I'm like, I'm going to try to do that. So I got in my car the next day, went around the country and it started working. And so I think just uh, early on in my Christian walk over spiritualization was definitely something I did. And, and I'm so glad to have learned from that and, you know, kind of teach other people about that. You ever get afraid? You look like the most courageous person in the world on camera. Yeah. Like, do you ever have anxiety? You're just maybe done it so much. It, it's like second half. Yeah. I mean, uh, may, maybe not too much. You know, I, I was uh, just the other day when we were filming the first episode of my TV show. Yeah. They're like, Jimmy, we're going to drop you off right here on this corner uh, with your camera and stuff. And you're going to wait there and someone in the next hour, hour and a half, like try to help someone here because we've got the truck position. So it, it's got to go down right here. And I'm like, okay, okay, sounds good. And they're like, by the way, this was voted last year, the most dangerous street corner in the entire United States. This year it was number two. I'm like, oh, all right, all right. And I go out there and, you know, I'm just like, people are staring at me. I look like an undercover cop. Like I'm just standing there and just like waiting and no one's picking me up and you know, sure enough, it all worked out. But I think, um, you know, you could try a million things to get rid of fear, ice baths, climbing a mountain and like looking in the mirror and saying, I'm amazing. It's like all these things that are temporary. But when you really look at it, it's like the righteous are as bold as a lion. And as long as you have a clear heart before God, you ain't living a sketchy double life, no skeletons in your closet. It's almost impossible not to be fearless because it just... Yeah, it's a, literally have, a verse. Have you ever been in danger in the stuff you're doing? Like, have you ever, you know, have has has there ever been any real danger in what you're doing? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a time you where you're working really hard, so probably not much, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, time and danger. I mean, I always will, like, I'll tell, like, something's about to go down and yeah. get in my car and drive away. <laughs> or, you know, like the other day I was in a Starbucks or uh, I was in a Barnes and Noble editing, talking to my editor, and a guy comes in with a full ski mask on and uh, he's pretending to look at books but not buy them, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, hey, let's go right now. My editor's <laughs> like, what? And we leave. I'm like, yeah, we'll, we'll probably, who knows what that guy was going to do. But so I have a little sense of awareness of like that. <laughs> but I think I, I feel like the way God's called me is to be like, I feel like God's like, I'll be your secret service. Just do what I've called you to do and be just like this kind of unaware, like little kid. And just don't worry, just do what I call you. I'll keep you safe, you know? So I kind of feel like Forrest Gump or something where I'm just like <laughs> super unintelligent, unaware, and just like so funny. I've through described, described you privately as Forrest <laughs> yeah, Gump. I'm yeah. like, this guy's like, for, like, he's not even aware there could be a problem. That's what they called me at the restaurant I used to they, work at. They did? Forrest Gump, yeah. Oh my gosh, It's like, you know, crazy. Dumb and Dumber, he's driving and he's like on the way to the airport and cars are blowing up behind him. He's just like, <laughs> Like, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> unaware. Yeah. Unaware of the problem. Yeah. So, hey, okay. So, I don't know the answer to this question. What What are your thoughts around revival and Gen Z? Like, like y in your videos, you're touching so many generations. Do you have a specific kind of call at all or thoughts around Gen Z? Because, you know, people are writing Gen Z off as far as the Lord, right? They're like, oh, most unchurched generation in, you know, 100 years. Do you have any thoughts yeah. around it? 
Yeah, the, the worst thing you could possibly do to connect to a generation or to connect someone is to dumb down the Bible, dumb down convictions, and try to relate that way. You might think you're going to relate to them, but they'll just see you as soft, and they'll see you as no backbone and see you as having something that they already have versus having something they don't have that they want, which is the fire in your eyes that comes from living with God. And so that's kind of how I see it. And I was at an NFL game this year, Denver Broncos game in, uh, yeah, in, in Denver. And I was a pregame. And before the game started, two kids came up to me, like, I don't know, 16, 17 years old, came up to me. One was a fan of me, had followed my videos, and one had no clue who I was, right? The reason I say the one had no clue who I was is that's very important later on because yeah. you'll see that he wasn't just nodding his head because he thought I was cool. It was he literally didn't care who I was. Yeah. And so the one kid, I take a picture with him. <laughs> The other kid, I start talking to him. Um, I think I asked him, like, you got pain in your body? Pray. And we see, like, his shoulder healed or his back or I don't remember what it was. And then I start asking him, like, have you, have you been following Jesus? And he's like, I used to when I was younger, but not really anymore. I was like, I guarantee you I can. I, I, I know there's two questions preventing you from relationship with God. And as soon as I answer these questions, you'll start following him tomorrow. And the kid's like, what the heck are you talking about? I said, yeah, it's very simple. It's you have two questions. Why do good things bad? Why do bad things happen to good people? And why are there so many religions? Those are like the two main stumbling blocks for young kids. And so I literally just broke it down for him. I said, man, Bad things happen to good people because we live in a fallen world of sin. There had to be two trees in the garden. There had to be a, you know, if I, I'm getting married, I got a fiance. If I said, you're going to marry me and you're going to love me, it wouldn't be real love. Love has to have a choice. And so there was two trees in the garden. There had to be a choice. And when man fell, sin entered the world. And now right now, if I wanted to, I could bust this over your head. And it's not God making me do it. It's my free will. And he's created free will. And it's really beautiful because that's where real love comes from is real choice. And because of that, crazy things happen that are sad, but we're in this world to bring heaven to earth and choose out of our free will to worship God, serve him, love people. And it's a very rare opportunity. Now it's like in eternity, I won't have someone cut me off in traffic and be able to give God glory through that. It's going to be a perfect place. So there's such a celebration when we go through trials now to be like, I'm going to keep my heart pure before God, no matter what's going on. So I answer that to him. I say, man, the enemy comes to kill, steal and destroy. Jesus came to give life, life abundantly. The worst thing you could possibly do is when something bad happens, blame God for it. That will make you really weird to worship and know him. You'll think he's this bipolar, loving, and mean thing. And when you understand it's the enemy that does those things, when a tragedy happens in your life, it won't make you like this. It'll actually be like, oh boy, you just broke my mom's ankle. I'm going to go pray for 600 ankles this week. And when hell starts seeing that, they start getting scared to poke you. So I answered that question. And then number two, why there's so many religions? I was like, obviously, you know, I say, man, Jesus is either real or he's a joke. It's like he either created the Grand Canyon and you and me and desires relationship with us, or it's all random by chance. I'm going to go on the first one and you don't counterfeit a $1 bill. So obviously he's going to counterfeit religions, take everything good from Christianity, except the saving grace of the blood of Jesus and make that a religion. And when that's a religion, everyone will love it, want to follow it. It's not controversial, but it won't save your soul. And so there's so many feel good religions that the enemy probably derived from Christianity and from the teachings of Jesus and his love, but removed repentance of the gospel because that's the one thing that actually saves us and transforms us. And he's just looking at me just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and right there, I just pray for him. I'm like, man, you need to give your life back to Jesus and get on fire for him. And he's like, yes, absolutely. I'm going to do that, sir. Yes. <laughs> and so I think young people are really simple. And when you can answer their questions straightforward, not be scared of them, they really like that because they want a challenge. Cool. You're getting married, bro. Yeah. Four months? Ah, uh, no, I think like 40 days. 40 days. 40 nights and 40 days. 40 days like and 40 yeah, nights, yeah. man. Whoa, wow. It's a trial going up to that, right? Yeah. The trial is just, you're on trial right now. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Are you excited? I'm, I'm very excited. And I found somebody that is a great partner with me yeah. to like co labor on what I'm doing. And, you know, people always say opposites attract, isn't that? We're kind of like the same person. Yeah, you are. I'm it, yeah. So it's a vibe and just like, I can't wait to, yeah, have a, have a marriage of something that I wanted to see. There is great marriages in my life that I see, but yeah. I think it's so powerful. Like 
people nowadays like do not want to get married, especially in the world, don't want to get married. And so if I could try to, you know, be married in a way that will make people believe in marriage again, that's candy. So that's what we'll try to it's do. It's going to be candy. Yeah. Do you want yeah. to say anything more about, because I have down about your TV show, is there any anything else you want to reveal about your new project? Because I was supposed to ask you, what are you working on? But we know it's your TV thing. And a yeah. book. is there anything else you want to say about it? Are you pretty excited about it? Because the prophetic word you got yeah. was actually not about doing what you're doing right now, but actually about doing a TV show. Exactly. And so, yeah, the prophetic word was crazy about the show. And people would always tell me like, oh, Jimmy, don't worry. Like, you know, you've got a YouTube show. So that's probably what she meant. Or you might get some on Amazon. That's what she meant. I'm like, no, you guys don't understand. You can't change a prophetic word. Like yeah. it's a TV show specifically. And I feel like I have to see that come to pass because I feel like God has that there. And so once it happened, I was just like, man, this is so incredibly cool. And in my life, I won't get into the second prophetic word, but there's two big prophetic words in my life. It was the TV show and then another one. And I remember telling God when I thought the TV show one was crazy, I said, if the TV show word happens and that happens, it'll give me faith for this other thing you've called me to do. To work for Chris Vallotton Ministries. Yes, and be a media director. No. <laughs> Personal Bro, masseuse. that's what my prophetic word yeah. was. You're going to work yeah. with Jimmy Darts. Really? Yeah. No way. Let's do this. Dang, all right. I'm joking, actually. Nah. Hey, try word. for a week, and if you want to quit, Oh, go no, I would love it, actually. <laughs> I would love it. I'd probably quit my job and follow you around yeah. filming you. But, yeah. yeah, really working on the show is going to be a blast. Um, we're coming out with a book. I think books are so powerful. I hate reading, but as you know, I've read uh, Poverty, Riches, and Wealth you like did. two times, and everywhere I go, I talk about it. And so when there's a book that actually hit home that's so powerful, like, you know, going to a movie is powerful. Why? Because three hours of being in a room with, like, no cell service, a book <laughs> is that kind of on steroids. It's really a place where you can read and, like, you know, it's, it's, it can really just – it's such an experience that you're so focused on it. And I want the book to be where it's like catalyzes people to chase their dreams, yeah. to hear God's voice and not over spiritualize it and do it. You know, so that's my heart is like 17 year old kid in his room reading it. And he's like, all right, I you know, I can do this. So working on that. And then, uh, yeah, we're coming out with like a, uh, a game, like a kindness game. Oh, yeah. That's what you're coming out with. You want to say anything else about that? I don't know what how much is secret. So. Yeah, yeah. I don't honestly know either how much is secret. But, yeah, uh, it, it's one thing to have 10,000 people comment, I'm crying watching a video. It's another thing if you can get those 10,000 people out there doing it. Exactly. And so many people comment and go, one day when I'm a millionaire rich, I'm going to do this. It's like, man, that's such a not a good way to live. Like, I was doing this when I had, like, one penny in a Santa suit in my costume. Like, <laughs> loving on someone doesn't cost money. So we're creating a game to give people inspiration of ideas they can do in their community, friends, family, to spread kindness. And uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, a little bit crazy. What's really cool about a book or anything like that is that you spend X amount of time writing it. So that's tough, right? But once you once you write that book, that book can go where you can't go. Yeah. It can be where you can't be. And it can be translated into languages you don't know. And all of a sudden, your life has, while you're asleep at night, you're still influencing people because people are reading yeah. that book, right? Be awesome for you to actually read it as an audiobook. Yeah. Like read your own audiobook because you do have a distinct voice. Yeah. Yeah. I would love, love to, to do that. Do that. Yeah. The guy that I'm writing the book with, obviously, I'm not the best writer in the world, but I have someone working out with me. And I don't know if I told you this, but mm. it's hilarious. His job before being a book writer, yeah. he was a midnight psychiatric crisis responder. So he'd show up at like 3 a.m. to someone going to like chainsaw their leg off or like somebody like trying to duct tape their car to their ceiling and he'd de-escalate it. And then what he did on the side, he was the mouse at Chuck E. Cheese. Are you kidding yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why, but that feels like the fir the perfect author to write your book. Yeah. The perfect <laughs> author to write your book. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Jimmy, this is called Cultural Catalyst. Yeah. What's it mean to be a cultural catalyst from your perspective? Yeah, you you would probably know better than me, but from <laughs> no, my I from, don't know about that. From my perspective, if it was in its simplest form, I would just say that God has created something where people 
can be original. In the kingdom, I feel like we're called to be original, yep. right? Yes. So cultural catalyst, I feel like it's hard to be a cultural catalyst if you just take something someone's doing, copy it, spin it a little. Like You can be excellent in doing that and then be powerful, but cultural catalyst, I feel like it'll be a dream or, or a desire, something from God that kind of the world's never seen and they do a double take. And if you just go for those things, um, you'll be able to shift culture and have a lot of influence and they won't see you as just like oh, a little copycat kid. So I don't, that's, that's the, the, the idea that I got that I'm doing was an idea that came from the Lord. And so that would probably be my best answer. Well, Hey, could you just do me a favor? Could you just give a prayer? We're going to have lots of people watching this. A lot of people don't know the Lord. Would you just take a minute just to pray for those folks? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. I just saw, uh, thank you for everybody watching it. People that know you, that don't know you. And I just pray that they would have a little Grinch moment in their heart, that their heart would just grow a little more and they would be able to let go of hurt or anything a leader has done or anything a church has done to offend them. Because if they met the real you, mm -hmm. they would they would be so radically encountered by love. They would just hit the ground crying. And mm -hmm. so I pray to just unwind any hurts that people have experienced so they can have your hug. And in that relationship with you, Jesus, you just, you mentor us so well and, and you convict us at times we need convicting. So I just thank you for everybody watching this and and uh, if you feel stuck in your life or whatever and you know God tap into that ask him about it and if you don't know him and you feel stuck in your life once you get to know him like so many things will happen like he's an amazing father he's so creative he's so smart he's just absolutely incredible and he's got something amazing for each and everyone's life it might not look like something that's known by men but it'll be known by heaven and you'll be so fulfilled in doing that so I just pray for radical love to encounter anyone watching this right now in Jesus name thank you holy spirit thank you pops bless them up amen hey so jimmy how do people get connected to you oh well you just want to put my phone number on the screen or we something do that. it's right here it's a tiktok it's it's at jimmy yeah, yeah. darts right yeah, there yeah. You on just, instagram and tiktok yeah they just look up jimmy darts they'll see it wherever yeah. and yeah and you, yeah you're famous just just type in jimmy darts oh you'll come up with all yeah just come join the family come and, join the family uh, of yeah. jimmy darts and you put your number up there i think the best way for them to get a hold of me is to get a hold of you so if you want to look, i'll put my private yeah. phone number on there or kathy's get, number yeah, yeah, yeah and pretty soon you're gonna have a woman on there too man you can it's gonna be Jimmy darts and wife. Yeah. It's actually funny when I do videos and we're always, you know, doing stuff on the streets with people. I usually give them my girlfriend's number. So Ooh, yeah, yeah. she gets a lot of random calls. Bad yeah. plan, right Fiance. There. She almost killed me. I was on the news. <laughs> I said, girlfriend, fiance. <laughs> yeah. Oh baby. Hey, we'll see you next week. God bless you.